Okay, so let's continue. Um, let's continue with uh, chapter five. So we see, you know, um, it's amazing wisdom that we see here, um, Paul, and um, the kind of, uh, if, you, if you just look at Paul's life, right, who he was and how, how much he has changed, right? How much his life has been transformed. Is he the same person you think? Is he the same person who was persecuting, who was, uh, you know, persecuting the way um, entering? It says, you know, Acts chapter 6 and 7 and all, we, we read about how they used to, they used to enter the household of people. Um, it says in Acts 8, um, uh, entering every house, dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. And so, um, is it the same person, you know, who's who's uh, who's got such high... Uh, values, right? Uh, and you think, you know, he's saying, you know, don't consider us as anyone, you know, we consider us as servants of Christ. The extent to which, right, walking with God closely can transform a life. You, know, you see it in us. He's totally, uh, you know, of, of course, he, he, we know that he was a work in progress, but you know, dying to the flesh, dying to the things of the flesh, and being so uh, available for the work of the Holy Spirit. You know, so available and and uh, so much so so hungry for God, uh, because He says, you know, oh that I might know Him and the power of His resurrection. You know, and uh, and so hungry for God and God using Him to to really establish doctrine, establish Scripture, right, which is which is really mind blowing. So. So we see that you know God can do amazing things and uh, in us and through us. So um, yeah, so it's it's a thing as like we as long as we choose to walk with Him, as long as we choose to serve Him and uh, and give ourselves to Him, right? Uh, there, there's no limit to what God can do in us and through us, right? Um, yeah. So we we see Paul's life and we we see this. So, wow, uh, so much has um, changed in Paul. Right. Okay, so let's look at verse um, uh, verse one from uh, chapter five. Okay, let me just open the notes. Sorry. Um, so we go to chapter five, and uh, so he's addressing a few other things. He's talking. He's been talking about division. Now he's talking about a really serious matter there, and he also, uh, you know, gives a very serious solution. Okay. Um, so let's look at that. Okay, chapter five, verse one. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles that a man has his father's wife, and you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from you. For I indeed am absent, as absent in the body, but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present him who has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorifying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you might be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Okay, so he's addressing something which is, um, uh, which is, again, you know, uh, in the eyes of God, in the eyes of uh, uh, God's people, we see that uh, it is a serious issue. So he's saying, you know, he's addressing, this is the report that I've received, that there is sexual immorality. Okay, and the word you use there is uh, for sexual immorality is pornea. Okay, we get the word pornography. I think it's derived from that. So it re refers to all kinds of sexual 
relationships or activity which is not ordained by God. Okay, now we need to understand that God is not against this whole concept of sex. You know, He only designed it, right? Uh, he designed marriage. So the thing is that it should be enjoyed within marriage and not outside of it. Within marriage and not before marriage, right? Um, and uh, in uh, in a marriage relationship. So any other sexual activity, which is, uh, you know, sex before marriage or sex outside of marriage, adultery or any other perversions, right? Homosexuality or lesbianism and all that is, it comes as a sexual perversion, not designed by God, not ordained by God. And it has its consequences. Right? It has its consequences. We, we read about adultery and we see that one who is committing, committing adultery, he destroys his own soul, meaning that you know, his thoughts, his imaginations, his mind, the ability to function well, the ability to you know, do things well, all that is destroyed. It is get, getting perverted, right? It is getting changed. Uh, so it's like a war against oneself when, when a person commits adultery. He's sinning against his body. Right, so um, so Paul is saying, you know, I hear that there is sexual immorality, and such sexual immorality that that is not there even among the Gentiles. Okay. What is it? It's uh, that um, uh, a man has his wife's, uh, sorry, father's wife, in the sense that he's having sexual relationship uh, with his father's wife. So obviously. Maybe the father's remarried or whatever, you know, whatever be the situation. But this is something that's happening and it not be so. This is not even there and the people are not living like this. Now here is a church of God among whom the temple of God, among whom the spirit of God dwells and such a thing is happening. And we see that he uses the word, you know, that a man has, which means that uh, uh, it is something ongoing, something continual, okay? something that's happening that is common knowledge, you know, which is which is even worse, right? Like, um, excuse me, sorry, which is even worse because people have come to know, right? Uh, the people have come to know. People are talking about it. And it's so serious that um, it's common knowledge, but nothing has been done about it. Everybody's talking about it. Everybody's talking behind that person's back, but they're not doing anything. They're not talking to the person to change that. Or maybe they have, maybe they told that person, you know, uh, you need to change and he is he's repentant and they're just leaving it. Right? What can we do? So he's, uh, you know, uh, so he's saying, you are puffed up, meaning you are being proud, and you have not mourned. Okay, so look, look at this. You know, so he's saying, here's a person who's living in sin, and he's part of your fellowship. You have not mourned. Okay, you have not grieved. You know, because uh, so that's something for us to learn. Understand that you know when when you see God's people sinning, when we see God's people, uh, you know, going out of God's will, going out of God's plan, living their own life, fleshly, and so on. So, does that do we you know is our heart grieved? Because that's the heart of God. Right? When God sees that, uh, He is grieved. That's the heart of God. So so Paul here is saying you know you have not mourned, but you've just been arrogant and proud. You should have deeply mourned that kind of sin and done something about it, acted on it, and not just let it be. Okay. So, Paul, the next thing is uh, something very, very uh, important, but we also need to understand it correctly. Okay. So, he says here that, you know, I indeed, absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present. Him who has done this deed, you know, as as if I was present there in person, I have judged this. That in the name of the Lord, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, um, several things we learn and understand. You know, when we are gathered together, uh, you know, the spirit of the Lord is present, and the power of the Lord is present. You know, so, so something 
happens when we gather together as a church. Not that it does not happen when we are alone, right? When we go together uh, or when we uh, when we are just worshiping God by ourselves. But the fact is that God's spirit, God's presence is there. God's power is present, right? So in a, in a corporate body for things to happen god wants things to happen god wants things to change so uh, so that is something that he mentions here that you know deliver such a one to satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of uh, the lord jesus so so he's judging based on the spiritual authority that god has given him okay so what is that kind of authority he writes in the in second corinthians he writes that you know, this authority has been given for edification for building up the church and not for a uh, building up the person and not for destruction right that is the kind of authority that has been given it's for edification not for destruction and um, uh, and he says you know the authority is is never to destroy a life but always to build a life so you know as leaders that is also something that we need to understand that god has given us authority and he's given us spiritual authority right as we do spiritual ministry he's given us spiritual authority and that that authority is not to control people's lives not to um, boss over people but it is to build up people okay in using it in correction using it in uh, you know uh, for edification to build people's lives right to instruct people in order to build them to instruct people in order to lead them to freedom not to bondage right not to slavery and definitely not to bondage to ourselves right okay so he um he condemned or sentenced he judged this person who was living in sin continuing in sin in the name of god you know as the, according to the authority that god had given him um and and this is something he did he said that he delivered this person to satan okay so and um, something that we need to understand because we understand that particular statement um based on what he writes after this okay so so let's not jump to any conclusions you know saying okay he's 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 got satan also with him and uh, you know he's saying okay satan now you come take control you know destroy that person uh, you know is he doing that because at first when you look at the verse that's what it says you know deliver such a one person to such a one to satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the lord at least his spirit is saved let his body be destroyed okay so and uh, it's as if satan is just waiting we know that he's a destroyer so you know you just hand over the person is that it you know when you read through the rest of the uh, uh, chapter we see that he is actually talking about separating that person putting that person away from the fellowship of the church okay so such an act he is referring to is as handing over what is happening the person is not in fellowship the f- person is walking in sin first of all and uh, you know sexual sin of this nature by that itself he is opening up his life to the work of the enemy and now paul is saying you need to separate him from the church okay because that person uh in other words you know if you read the rest of the thing he cannot influence i don't want him to change influence others so that others also follow the similar kind of lifestyle you know a little leaven is what it takes to uh, uh you know leaven the uh, full batch of dough so he's talking about leaven he's talking about yeast you know like a baker will use in uh, in the uh, in that uh, flour in that dough so that it will it will make the dough rise the when the bread is baked it it rises up okay uh, something like baking soda or something that we use right so he's he's saying this is be this will be the effect of bat person sin full lifestyle to the entire church you know it, it, you, it's just one person but he's going to you know it's going to spread so you need to keep that person out so when you actually keep person out 
who's unwilling to repent, continuing in this sinful lifestyle, then it is, you know, he, he is brought out of that protection of the fellowship of the church. You know, there's no more, he's no more having access to people's inputs in his lives. He's no more having access. That kind of protection that God has over the people, you know, over a particular church even, he is coming out of that, right? And and that is like handing over to Satan. Because Satan already will have inroads in his life, but now even more so, so that it comes to a destruction or some damage to his life. Okay, so uh, destruction of the flesh. Okay, what is that word flesh? Okay, so you understood this? Any any um, uh, doubts here? Okay, so let, let's finish this, and then you can you know we can discuss further, right? So. Uh, he uses the word destruction of the flesh. So, what is that word flesh? The flesh word, uh, the word flesh in Greek is sarx, which means uh, uh, it's, it, it re refers to people, okay, in, in general, you know, yeah, right? Uh, let's look at some scriptures. Acts chapter 2, verse 17. Um, okay, Acts chapter 2, verse 17. And it shall come to pass that God will pour out my spirit on all flesh, okay? Referring to Joel, Joel 2, 28. God will pour out the spirit on our flesh. So it's referring to people. Because the following verses talk about what will happen when the spirit is on all flesh. He's talking about sons and daughters, um, young men and uh, old men and uh, maidservants and so on. So it refers to people, right? people of God, people on whom God will pour out the spirit. So flesh, you know, gentle. It also refers to the physical body, you know, our body. And it is also referred to something which is carnal, which is uh, which is earthly and not spiritual, opposite of spiritual, like the flesh. Now, flesh also in natural terms, you know, it means like, uh, you know, um, food or uh, some nourishment. Um, like when we look at John chapter 6, um, where I think this is um, John 6 and... Uh, yeah, John 6 and uh, verse uh, 51, okay. okay. Verse 51, and is, is referring to himself, you know, he says, uh, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh that I will give for the life of the world. And the same word is used there. So it's... Uh, you know, figuratively, he's referring to his flesh as the nourishment, uh, you know, because he's referring to himself as the living bread. So in all these contexts, this word is used, the word flesh. Uh, but here, uh, when we, when we, so when we look at it, he's saying, um, trouble, will, you know, destruction of the flesh. So it means that the individual, this person, when he's put out of fellowship of the church, um, then he will have trouble in his natural life. Okay, in his physical life, it ref it, it could be anything. It could be uh, you know lack of peace. It could be opening up his you know opening up the doorway for demon the, for Satan to come and and steal, kill, and destroy. Really create damage, create confusion. So uh, so destruction of of the natural, so so that is the thing, right? So, um, so this is something that we see. So, um, so we also need to understand that uh, Paul uh, prays a similar thing. You know, uh, this delivering to Satan happens to uh, 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 you know in First Timothy chapter one. Also, we read about this. Okay, so let's read that First Timothy chapter one. And verse 20, um, 1 Timothy 1. Okay, so um, it says um, about people who actually, uh, because of their conscience, uh, they were, their faith, uh, you know, it, it says it, their faith have suffered, uh, you know, concerning the faith have suffered, suffered shipwreck, meaning that uh, they no more believe the way you, they used to believe. You know, their, their journey with Christ, their spiritual life has 
has come to a standstill you know it's like it's like shipwreck so he's talking about two people hymenaeus and alexander verse 20 of whom i delivered to satan that they may learn not to blaspheme so these people they were with them but something happened because they didn't maintain a good conscience before god and man so something happened and they now they've started blaspheming okay talking bad uh, about the whole, about the word of god about uh, jesus you know talking ill and and blaspheming saying things that are blasphemous right without any reverence um heresies so they are blaspheming so uh, so he's saying you know so it's such an extreme case where they are creating damage to the temple of god right so here also we see that Uh, Paul saying that this person is going to uh, be creating damage to the body, right? Um, so he says, um, you know, this this extreme uh, extreme decision of putting out a per- putting a person out of fellowship from the body, you know. Uh, so it seems very. Uh, very paradoxical or very the very opposite of why a you know why a church uh, exists of course it exists to shine light uh, so that people might come and uh, it shine light people might know the truth people might grow people might be planted but in these extreme cases uh, there needs to be some decision taken to to protect the body Okay. it's always this extreme case okay um which is uh, which is the man it's either you know heresies or uh, wrong doctrines which are destroying people's lives if you know the person is doing that or if there is a open brazen uh, unrepentant sinful lifestyle okay so 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 the thing is this so this is what uh, paul says you know i handed it over for the destruction of the flesh okay but before that you know you see that you see the heart you know he's saying you know i you have not moaned you see the sin and you are not puffed up you have not moaned um this particular uh, act or what is happening okay so we we learn something um about uh the feast as well you know the feast of the passover and the feast of the unleavened bread you know, he, so in in verse 6 he says your glorifying is not good do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump so this is what it is it just takes a small amount of leaven to to actually influence and change the whole um, you know batch of dough so you truly uh therefore purge out the old leaven what is he saying you know that old leaven needs to be separated needs to be cleared out so that you might be unleavened okay um purge out so that you might be a new lump or a fresh lump without leaven since you truly are unleavened for indeed christ our passover was sacrificed for us so is referring to the you know the feast of the passover the piece of, uh, sorry piece of the unleavened bread is where there would be uh, you know there 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 would be a uh, the feast of the passover would happen on the 14th day of that particular hebrew month and uh, leavened bread was not eaten okay so all those days on the 14th day sorry on the 14th day the the bread with yeast or bread with that leaven was not eaten okay and from the 15th day then for the next 7 days from the 15th day it was the feast of the unleavened bread where there was no yeast kept in the household the household our whole household was clean and in preparation for these two feasts okay so he's referring to that because that east or the sin uh the east referred to sin and the old life and uh, old life of uh, slavery in egypt it's it, it's coming out of that right so is uh, paul is referring to that and he's saying that you know this is what it is the fast uh, the, the feast of passover you know you know won't know what it refers to deliverance of the lord the lamb of god slain 
right? Uh, and the feast of the unleavened bread, referring to the the sin, the old life, everything being taken out and uh, being separated. We our lives being separated. So, uh, so he's saying, you know, uh, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump, and you truly are unleavened? For indeed, Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. So. In verse 8, he's saying, let us keep the feast. Let us keep the feast of the Passover and the feast of the uh, unleavened bread. Right? He's, he's referring to, primarily he's referring to the unleavened bread and saying, let us keep the feast. How will you keep the feast? You will eat unleavened bread, a bread that does not contain yeast. A bread does not happen, have the leaven. So let's continue with that feast. Okay. What is he actually referring to? He's referring to sin. He's referring to the old life. He's referring to a sinful lifestyle. He's saying, let's not keep that. Let's let that not be part of our life. Okay. Um, uh, so he's saying, verse 8, let us keep the feast not with old leaven nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth okay so referring to that feast okay now uh, any questions based on what we saw just now okay so we we've seen a very important uh, or a extreme a decision that paul has taken uh, in the church at corinth a church which he established and this extreme reaction or decision is based on something which is very seriously wrong which is happening there and that was a continuing lifestyle sexual sin and um, and in response to that he takes this decision okay and it, it talks about handing over to satan for destruction of the flesh so this is what it is. It was a separation of that person from the fellowship. Uh, you know, a decision to keep that person out of fellowship. And we see that example in Hymenaeus and Alexander as well. You know, they were blaspheming the Lord. There also, Paul says, you know, I, uh, you know, handed them over to Satan. So, so we know, we can infer that, okay, this is what it is. They were put out of fellowship from that body of Christ so that they, you know, they, they, they will be suffering because Satan will come in and Satan will open the door. I mean, they've already opened their door to Satan. So there will be destruction of the flesh in the sense, their natural way of living. Uh, maybe it will be affected in some way or the other they, because they're not under the protection right uh, right now. They, in fact, they themselves walked out of protection by their actions. Okay, now as a second level or a, you know, added, added thing, they are now out of protection of the church as well. Okay, so something that we also learn is that you know, when we are in fellowship, as a body of Christ, it does not matter, you know, which church, uh, you know, uh, of course, it has to be a Bible believing church. So there is a certain protection that comes upon us as people of God, right? The, and we need to value that, you know, we are coming under the protection, under the covering of the Lord, of the Lord God. Uh, when we are, when we live in fellowship with other believers, and and it's not just living in fellowship, uh, you know, it's it's we are truly being part of the body of Christ, you know, serving and helping and receiving help and and so on, right? So, any questions here, or anything that you want to add? Okay, clear, fine. Okay, no questions for Kiran, for for Aaron also no questions. Okay, so what, what if you know? So if you were just place yourself, if you, if you were in the in the in Paul's shoes, right? So what would you do if such a thing is happening in the church that you're leading in the fellowship? You know, and it's a, it's a, and it's something that we need to think about, right? Uh, think about and say, okay, um, is my heart for people, or is uh, you know my concern for people? Is that coming in the way of 
you know taking some, some certain strong decisions for the sake of the kingdom okay because obviously this is uh, this is of importance um because you're protecting the work of god you're protecting uh, you know this thing from spreading to other believers in the church um so you're obviously you know doing something good doing something right but it needs to be done in a in a manner that's careful in a manner that's sensitive in a manner that's um, you know uh only for you know you need to be very 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 sure okay sure of the facts sure of what's happening and sure of this particular uh, this decision right um and uh, you know this doesn't end here we're going to read in second corinthians when we study you know what happens okay that uh, this man who was put out of fellowship he is now back right? he, he paul writes to the believers and say okay looks like there is change now take him back okay so it's not like okay you know we've sent this person out sent this family out you know they stay for and ever it's not that their lives are changed they are, and so they welcome back into fellowship restoration so the this decision is actually for restoration so that there will be repentance and that there will be restoration even though you know it seems so severe you know for the destruction of the flesh that its spirit might be saved right um this is the intention okay right okay so let's look at uh, verse 9 okay um, chapter 5 verse 9 i wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people yet i certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with covetous or extortioners or idolaters since then you would need to go out of the world but now i have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner not even to eat with such a person for what I have, what have i to do with judging those uh, also who are outside do you not judge those who are inside but those who are outside god judges therefore put away from yourself the evil person okay so this is the decision that he's saying you know put away from yourself uh, the yourselves the evil person so he, he goes on to say you know he starts by saying i uh, wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company so which means uh, you know there was another letter which was obviously written which uh, which is not there as part of scripture Okay. maybe it was it was a short letter maybe it was we don't know right so we don't know any details about that so uh, it says um, an earlier letter letter that he had written so he's he's referring to that i wrote to you in my epistle so of course we call this first corinthians because that's the one we we have and uh, it is there as part of scripture as a canon of scripture um, but paul is referring to another letter that he had wrote uh, he had written earlier okay so yeah so what is he saying here in that letter he had written saying you know don't keep company with sexually moral people people who are sexually moral don't um, you know don't encourage don't be part of that you know don't be part of their uh, whatever you know don't keep company with those people right so so here he's clarifying okay so obviously they probably the, they misunderstood his instruction um, so he's clarifying that instruction so he's saying you know Uh, in 10 verse 10 yet i certainly did not mean with the sexually moral people of this world okay um so he's saying you know when i said you can you should not keep company uh it's not like you know then you would have to go out of the world because you know knowing corinth right it was a very immoral place right even the worship was had to do with you know sexual immorality right in that temple temple of aphrodite was a goddess of love uh, there were a lot of temple prostitutes that people would even men and women would be there uh, and people would go and as an act of worship it would be you know uh, a sexually immoral immoral act so 
so such a place so so he's writing to them don't come, keep company with sexually immoral people which means that hey uh, you know it means that i have to go out of corinth or even go out of the world you know, because the world is world have, in, the, in the world there are such people so uh, paul is clarifying and is saying you know it's, it's i did not mean sexually immoral people of the world but i'm referring to people who are in the church okay uh, so the word that he uses there again is uh, a greek word which means do not mingle with or mix up together don't be intimate with right such people now um, then you might we might again have a question hey didn't jesus come to save such people am i not you know he ate with sinners so you know sh- should i not uh, you know how can i like stay away how can i reach out to them you know how can i uh, share christ with them right we might have those questions right so paul is referring to something uh, which he's not referring to that because obviously he was traveling he was meeting all kinds of people and in fact the church in corinth itself it was established by paul which means that all these people you know he writes later you were like this like you were idolaters you were you know uh, sexually immoral people he writes to them uh, so he's saying you were some of you you were uh, you know in next chapter actually he talks about that but you were washed you were sanctified so so for paul to share the gospel to meet with them talk to them share the gospel these these were the kind of people right? but they heard they changed so what is paul saying you know it's not like that you know we, we should not reach out we should not uh, you know talk to people who are uh, living such in fact we must we should but he's talking about a different level of relationship where you know your 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 mingling your intimate with them your uh, you know you, uh, so it's it's like um, you're associating with them day in and day out and uh, you're being a very close associate with them right so what is going to happen that then uh, that company you know if you're going to be you know having that kind of a thing it's going to influence you it's going to affect you okay so that is why he's saying don't keep company with sexually immoral people and he lists out other people also he says covetous extortioners idolaters okay he said uh, i did not mean the this kind of people of this world but of course if a believer okay so he's saying uh, what is he saying if anyone named a brother was 11 okay this person is named a brother meaning that person is is a believer in church uh, is a brother in christ or a, she is a sister in christ and they are continuing to live this kind of a life okay which is unrepentant they are not repenting okay so people have told maybe pastors addressed maybe other believers have told they not they not bothered they saying it's okay but they are continuing to come and have fellowship and uh, they are you know living such a life right so what paul is saying is that um, don't keep company you know don't be mingling with them don't associate with them closely okay so that's the thing you know when you say mingle it means to mix right so mix where one one is mixed with the other so he's saying don't mingle don't associate closely with them or intimate with them okay uh, a few other verses that talk about is uh, that we see and see also second thessalonians 3 verses 14 and 15 where he says if anyone does not obey our word in the epistle note that person and do not keep company with them that he may be ashamed yet do not count him as an enemy but admonish him as a brother you see the difference right now it's a it's a it's a walk of grace it is uh, something that needs to be done with wisdom okay so he's saying see they're not obeying they are unrepentant don't keep company with them but don't count them as an enemy you know don't look at them as an enemy but admonish them which means where uh, you know uh, um, like instruct them sharply or correct them sharply that's admonition right uh, correct them sharply as you would to a brother right 
admonish him as a brother okay so so the thing is that um, that person sees that okay now i'm not i can't relate anymore i i don't have the same kind of relationship because that has changed because uh, now i've been advised uh, you know that person is not moving with me as they used to and so on and and hopefully that will lead to that person changing right so he's saying you know let that person uh, so that he may be ashamed and uh, that do not count him as an enemy but admonish him as a brother okay, so so the entire list right we see you know extortion covetous all that is mentioned there and he's saying you know if a person is a reviler and you know, one who's constantly criticizing cursing uh, people one who's a drunkard um you know don't keep company okay now verse 12 he says what have i to do with judging also who are those who are outside you know the outside world you know i who am i to judge god will judge them but when it comes to people in the church in fellowship you know i need to discern i need to discern and i need to judge and therefore you come to this decision put away from yourselves the evil person okay so then we might uh, ask the question you know um, uh, what about the grace of god you know doesn't grace of god mean so god tolerated so much of my life uh, and yet he you know he came down and he died for me yes he did right he he died for for our sins and uh, he rose again for our uh, for our um, you know justification so uh, that is what he did uh, so what about the can't should should i not extend the same grace right to others yes definitely you know but grace cannot be without referring to the truth okay like sometimes what happens is like uh, we don't address the truth right you know because we are afraid what will the other person think or maybe they'll stop being maybe they'll stop coming to church if i address the truth or maybe they will um uh, you know maybe our relationship will change if i address the truth if i tell them hey this is wrong what you're doing is wrong uh it needs to change right but grace is always with truth okay and uh, and 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 you know scripture talks about that we speak the truth in love we speak the truth communicate the truth in love so that's the standard that's the instruction okay so psalm 57 verse 10 for your mercy reaches unto the heavens and your truth unto the clouds you know you see you see mercy and there is also truth psalm 85 and verse 10 mercy and truth have met together righteousness and peace have kissed so righteousness peace mercy truth so it's not isolated it's not either mercy or truth it's it's with the truth okay um john 1 and verse 17 uh, john writes grace and truth came through jesus christ the lord himself when he extended grace to us to the entire world something that we did not deserve it was with truth okay he did not say okay um, you know you're fine as you are but here i'm extending grace no he said no this is this is what it is you are in sin you need a savior uh, if not you will be condemned that is the truth and it came with grace and i'm extending grace and mercy that you do not deserve but this is your condition if you do not change this is the place where you're heading to right so um in this whole um uh, you know in, in this whole scenario right um this extension of grace should be with truth okay so and like paul says in second thessalonians he says that you know admonish him as a brother so um so why because of uh, you know because we understand we esteem the word of god and uh, the truth of god's word we esteem the people of god because they are in fact his building his flock his field uh, his temple right so we do this in love but at the same time we do it to um, you know with being very sensitive right so um so 
the fellowship, you know, a person wanting to be part of a fellowship, being part of a church, is is based on the word of God, based on the standards of the word of God. It's not like a, it's not like a club where I I do what I want and I and I still want to be, you know, part of what is happening, right? Uh, it's based on the word of God, and uh, you know, uh, so which means that they are they're coming to a place of. Uh, it is a process, right? Again, they're coming to a place of being obedient to the word of God, receiving the word of God, willing to be ch changed by the word of God, right? And uh, and uh, being repentant for things that are, you know, not uh, in line with the word of God, right? So um, so that is the thing. So if somebody is unwilling to submit to the word of God, you know, that's the important thing. Not submit to a person, but submit to the word of God and unwilling to remove sin. Okay, this is there. The word of God clearly points out, and people have pointed out. And uh, is if such a person is unwilling to remove sin, then there needs to be a very tough decision to, you know, uh, stay, you know, uh, change um, or stop such people from attending the fellowship. If not for, uh, you know, a long time, maybe for a short time, so that they learn. It is with the intention of restoration. It is the intention that people will repent and come back to fellowship. Okay. Right. Okay. So we'll stop here. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, any doubts, any clarifications on what we, you know, it's it's a it's a pretty important topic, and also quite a uh, quite a difficult thing, right? Um, but it's it's there in the word, and uh, difficult to uh, difficult to implement, you know, in some cases. But it's there for us, and we need to obey, and we need to do it in the right way, because we you know, people do it in the wrong way. The right thing, you know, this is this is God's standard, but you do it in the wrong way, or do it with the wrong spirit, then we destroy people. Right, we completely destroy people's lives, and there's no, you know, they're just completely destroyed. There's no restoration. But God, you know, whenever He issues a command, whenever He gives an instruction, it is always redemptive in nature. It is so that we might be prevented, and it is so that we might come back. There will be restoration, and it's always He's a redeemer, He's a redemptive. So we need to have the same heart while we do this out, carry this out. So it's going to hurt us. And it's going to hurt others, definitely. But it's going to hurt us as a minister of God, right? So, are you willing to be hurt? Are you willing to mourn um, that sin or that person who is caught in that sin? Uh, because that's the heart of God. That's the heart of the Father. Okay. Okay. So we'll stop here, and uh, you guys have a good weekend. Today's Friday. Um, God bless. We'll catch up uh, next week. Okay. Right. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, boss.